morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Fricker, the president of the ICA. It's my great pleasure to see you all here. Uh, may I first commence um, the proceedings of this morning by inviting all of you to be upstanding as we welcome to the conference His Excellency, the Honourable Hugh Van Ley, AC, Governor of South Australia. Please rise. Thank you, Your Excellency. And please remain upstanding uh, for a moment. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Your Excellency, for being here. And we'll be hearing from His Excellency in just one moment. Of course, we're meeting today on Kana lands, and it's our great pleasure now to welcome to the podium Kana Elder Michael O'Brien. Could we please welcome Elder Michael? Thank you. Tuwela Mani Budnik Tuwela Wakana Padnik Lala Nadlo Kamaka Yara Kumanindi Nina Mani. Nina Mani is the words of hello of the Ghana people, and uh, your response would hopefully be Mani I being good or Mani Yaka if you're not so good. So, Nina Mani. <laughs> ah, Nai Chaya. So, uh, Nai Ghana, Buka Mankalankla, Madawa Chunga, Ghana Mina, Nai Nari Kamatbi Maricha, Nai Wangadi Mani the Budni, Gani Yatana, here in Diyata, Tandendanga, Tandawama, Karawirapara, Gadi Yata. Um, welcome, welcome to the, the lands of the Ghana people or the Mina people or the Adelaide Plains people. Uh, today, you sit upon the land of the Kangaroo Plains being Adelaide Oval. And behind me uh, is known as the Red Gum Forest River or Torrens River. And uh, further to the north, we have uh, uh, the place called uh, the Emu Place. Um, and uh, Adelaide is known as Tandendunga, being the dreaming place of the big red kangaroo. And the cloak that I wear is the cloak of that kangaroo. But what's really unique about Adelaide itself is uh, the centre of Adelaide is Victoria Square. Well, it's actually not a square. It's actually the shape of the Ghana shield, which is this shield here. So we have these three wonderful elements being the shield the emu, and the kangaroo. And it's a bit of a theme here, because where do we see those three elements? We actually see them on our national emblem, don't we, or crest. And so South Australia was known as Bamba Bambaya, being the conference centre of our nation's First Nations people, and so all our First Nations people would come to Adelaide to celebrate and to share in quabri or to uh, knowledge or artefacts or all of those wonderful things of uh, our people sharing, which is really important and which is why you've really come today is to share in this wisdom and knowledge. And so a welcome isn't just saying are you well when you come to a place like the words tell us. It is saying hello. But more importantly, it's asking you where have you been and what are you doing because... Your face tells you where you've been, but your heart tells you where to go. And so a welcome was really important. And so today I, I want to share a little bit of history. Those particularly uh, from South Australia uh, would uh, hopefully know this information. Uh, but South Australia was a unique place. Why? Because we don't have convicts that settled this place. We were a free colony. Now, I want to take you back, and it's wonderful to have the, the, the governor here today uh, because I'm going to show you uh, one of the governor's flags. 
uh, which people don't know. And if you get the opportunity to go to the beautiful home of the governor, uh, you'll see uh, this image a little bit better than the way I've drawn this image, but you'll see this image in his beautiful ballroom on his stained glass window. Um, but there was a special image because um, this um, is a flag that the governor had uh, back in 1876 to 1904. And uh, the image uh, here... Uh, is not only just of the Union Jack, but you'll see something very interesting in the middle. There's actually two people. Uh, one was an Aboriginal person. The second person is a person of Britannia. Now, what's interesting is that the Aboriginal person is sitting on a rock throne. The person from Britannia is reaching out to be welcomed by the Aboriginal person. But what's even more interesting is there is a kangaroo carved in the rock above the Aboriginal person's head. And as we know, Adelaide is known as the kangaroo place. So it was an interesting flag. But it goes even further, because it was actually the common seal of South Australia. So all the legal documents that South Australia had in those early days were stamped with that particular seal. And so even the Constitution of South Australia has that common seal on it. Now, just to help you, because I'm sure you know this, but the uh, Union Jack is made up of three nations, um, being uh, St. Patrick, St. George and St. Andrew, which I'm sure you know is uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England. Now, and I'm sure you also know that it was 1836 that South Australia was formed, and we know that because our basketball team, the Adelaide 36ers, is called the 36ers for that very reason. Now, you also would know uh, the king of the day, uh, because that's the main street of Adelaide, being King William Street. And you would know the queen of the day because the city is known as Adelaide, therefore it was Queen Adelaide. But there was a governor, uh, the first governor, uh, he wore a, a bit of a funny hat. Um, he wore a hat a bit like this. Uh, his name was Governor Highmarsh. Now, he set up his home in Highmarsh there, and, which was a significant place for the Aboriginal people because it was a place known as the place of the high or the chest. Um, and even the Christian people knew that it was a very important place because many churches will be found in that particular area. Um, but what's even more important uh, is that uh, obviously two uh, key gentlemen being Matthew Flinders who uh, mapped out all of uh, Australia and particularly South Australia and named Australia uh, to give its name of the great southern land. But, um, but also uh, we had another gentleman, Colonel Light, who, who really um, uh, mapped out Adelaide and he did that in a... Uh, an interesting way. Some people say the land spoke to him. Some people say that Mullawilla Burka, the last of the Aboriginal people, spoke to him, um, as well as the fact uh, he himself was a clever man, because he not only put Adelaide in the north, south, west, east directions and put the green belts in, but he actually uh, designed the Adelaide city itself in the shape of the kangaroo, and North Adelaide in the shape of the emu. And as I said earlier, Victoria Square being the shield, which is really amazing. And so Colonel Light, um, uh, he was a, an interesting character. But as we know, being a free colony, not a convict colony, people came and how did they come? Well, they came in boats, didn't they? Just like these ones. <laughs> now, what's even further uh, interesting is uh, when people came... Uh, they like to, um, you know, mark their territory. Uh, but, um, and they did that by putting their flags upon the nation. But when they came to uh, particularly South Australia and Australia in itself, because our people have been welcoming people uh, to this nation for thousands of years, and one of the things that we've never said is, go home. That's because you don't leave. <laughs> no, it's not true. It's because you don't, you'll never see me at the end of a conference. I'm always at the beginning, so I can't say goodbye. But largely, we don't actually have a word for goodbye. We have a word for see you later, 
which is very interesting, and I will say those words. Um, but the flag that they found when they came to this nation was a different flag. It was this flag. The flag of the Aboriginal people being the red, being the earth, the black being the people, and the yellow, not just the sun, the giver of life and hope, but really you. Because when we extend our hand out, we can say, Nina Mani being welcome, because that's what our people have always done, is welcome people to this nation. Whether it be the English, whether it be the French, or whether it be uh, the Chinese, or whether it be the Dutch as well. And so it's an interesting place. Our people believe strongly that when you walk this land, it will connect with you, and therefore it is your home. And that's what a welcome does because the spirit people of my ancestors have been called upon here today to bless you, to bring that goodness, to send away that badness, but to remind you that when it is your home, we look after it. And if you look after it, it will look after you. And that's very important to understand. And so as you can see, history, our people were always about coming together. And it was demonstrated by that king. It was demonstrated in his letter, the king's letter being the letter's patent. And he wrote those words. He wanted the land to be owned and occupied and shared by the Aboriginal people. But sadly, because he died six months after writing the king's letter, uh, sadly, uh, that was lost. And sadly, that letter never reached the shores of South Australia until 1904, which was after Federation. I, myself, was never an Australian citizen until the 27th of May of 1967. What's interesting, I see that you're using an app called Nexus, and in that particular period, Nexus was known to be the campaign. What many people don't know is that Aboriginal people did get counted in the census and therefore becoming Australian citizens in 67. But the second part of that referendum was they wanted to increase the number of House of Representatives, which got a no vote. But really, when you think about it, it got a yes vote. Why? Because if you increase the number of population, you increase the number of senators and House of Representatives anyway. So in actual fact, it was a success for the government anyway. Maybe not for the Aboriginal people. But I've gone on far too long. And so, therefore, I hope today and the rest of this conference is about knowledge, it's about truth, it's about sharing, um, and it's about voices, because that's what Na uh, this year of NAIDOC was all about. But I want to leave these words, which is my onjiga, my onjiga, nachi yukandaya, nachi yukandaya, padnia do wadu, which is saying uh, we can walk, we can sit, but please observe, please listen to the land. When you do those things, it brings cultures together. It gives us the ability not only to be brothers and sisters, but to walk and sit upon that in harmony and to do it together. And that's what this is all about, is about doing things together. So uh, as I said earlier, nakata, see you later, and nature, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Michael, for that very gracious and generous welcome to country. And may I say informative and quite entertaining as well. And we have a project to go and find that seal. So Jeff James, we might be coming your way to have a see if uh, we can find it again. But we won't steal it, we'll, we'll give, leave it back. <laughs> Look, it is now my great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, His Excellency, the Honourable uh, Hien Van Lu Van Lee, uh, AC, Governor of South Australia, uh, to come to the stage to officially open the conference. Would you please join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Governor? Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your warm welcome. Welcome to Adelaide on this beautiful spring day. Let me first start by acknowledging uh, Ms. Julia Mant, Mr. David Fricker, Ms. Amela uh, Silipa, and all the dignitaries and leaders within this uh, organization, all the conference delegates, ladies and gentlemen. 
I also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're gathering here this morning, the Ghana people, and we respect their spiritual relationship with their land. I also thank Mikio for his gracious welcome to the country. We are enriched that we share our land with Aboriginal people, the world's longest continuous civilization and living culture. To all our guests from interstate and in, uh, internationally, let me note that here in Adelaide, all 29 of our parklands and squares of our wonderful city have been given Ghana names in acknowledgement of their original custodianship. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here this morning to officially open the Designing the Ar Archive Conference. Adelaide is proud to host the international conference in the year that our state's records celebrates its centenary as the oldest government archive in Australia. To our international and interstate guests, a warm welcome to Adelaide and to South Australia. Welcome to the city of churches and the festival state, and consistently rank among the top 10 most livable city in the world for many, many, many years. Here we are always pleased to showcase our heritage, our glorious scenery, and our abundance of superb food and wines, of course. I also welcome you to the state that was forged in tradition, progressed, and reformed. As you heard from uh, Uncle um, Mick O'Brien, the settlers here come to South Australia as a free settlers, unlike many other states whose settlers were the convicts. But the settlers who arrived in South Australia in 1836 had a mission to establish a great society built upon the principles of enlightened reform. The very streets of our city where we stroll every day are living archives and preserve the names of social reformers such as the Edward Gibbon Wakefield, Robert Goucher and George Grote and names of many, many eminent members of the reform clubs in Britain at the time who actually designed the legislation to establish South Australia as a free colony back in the 1800s. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as many of you may know, this year, South Australia celebrates our major historical milestone, the 125th anniversary of women's suffrage. We were the first jurisdiction in Australia and one of the first in the world to grant universal suffrage alongside the right to stand for Parliament. One of the symbols of the passion and the fortitude of the suffrages was a petition containing 11,600 signatures. The original copy of the petition is kept in the basement of our Parliament House. But the work by our archivists has enabled the documents to be much more accessible to the public. State Records of South Australia and History Trust of South Australia have together created an index to the names and places in the petition. It is accessible online and people can search their family name to discover their connection with this watershed document. You can see a map and witness the myriad of towns and places across the state and even interstate where people got behind this groundbreaking reform. Similarly, there is important work occurring at the South Australian Museum, making family uh, genealogies accessible for Aboriginal people using data from university expedition of the 1930s. These archives can help family researchers and assist Aboriginal people to link up with family and community. Ladies and gentlemen, these, among many other possible examples, show that archives play an important role in preserving our stories and our collective memories. They are a reminder of the passions and foresights 
of those who have gone before, that they were no less wise than we. Through the work of archivists, these records of the past remind us of the aspiration and ideals that shaped our communities and our society. They remind us that some important work needs to continue. So ladies and gentlemen, your important work preserves the past as a vital source to provide signposts to our future. I wish you all well for a productive and stimulating conference where you share expertise, spark new ideas, and forge new friendships. It gives me a great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to officially declare the conference open. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those words uh, to open this conference. You've inspired us to redouble our efforts in the next few days uh, to cover as many topics and explore as many themes as possible. Uh, His Excellency now has to leave and attend to another appointment. Could you please join me in thanking him for his presence here this morning as he, uh, as he departs. Thank you again, Your Excellency, very much. Welcome once again uh, to uh, the, the ICA, Iran's Parbika ACA Annual Conference. Um, look, I'm going to talk to you this morning as, as primarily in my capacity as president of the ICA. Uh, and can I just uh, commence by saying it is such a pleasure again to be convening a, an annual conference of the ICA in partnership with our Australian New Zealand branches here, of course, professional associations. Um, can I also once again acknowledge uh, the Ghana people upon whose lands this city has been built and thank you again, uh, Uncle Michael, for, for that very, very gracious welcome to country. And I think in, re in receiving that welcome to country, I should let all of our visitors know we're sort of undertaking a commitment to behave ourselves while we're here. Uh, Michael told us if you look after the land, the land looks after you and we will certainly do that while we're here on your country. And so thank you very much once again for that welcome. And if anyone plays up, I'll hear about it and I'll report back to you. There you go. <laughs> uh, look, um, this, uh, this conference is, is really the premier international event uh, for our, our profession. Uh, you know, this is the opportunity for us to gather from, from all corners of the world and share knowledge, insights, contribute to each other's thinking, uh, and to develop that professional intelligence that I, I keep talking about that enables us to go back to our daily lives with a much richer understanding of what we're doing and where we're going with the work that we do. Many people at these events always come up to me and say, being an archivist is such a lonely job. You know, so many of us work in very small teams or in the corner of a, a university, a library or whatever, and from day to day it can feel like we're the only ones dealing with these very big issues. Events like this really nourish us and really uh, motivate us for doing the work that we need to do. And this conference, I think sets a new tone for our, our discussion as a professional community. You know, in past events, we've spent quite a bit uh, investing our efforts in looking at digital archiving, about the application of, a, of a, uh, new technologies, about better ways of description, about better methods of providing access, etc. But this, this theme, uh, and I really do congratulate uh, Julie, Julia, uh, Eric, uh, Peter, uh, the concept of this designing the archives is really takes us, the archivist, out of the picture and it puts people in the middle of the picture. It's a user-centred way of thinking about what we do and why. Who are the people that visit archives? Who are the people that create records that are archived with us? What do they want? What are their expectations of us? Because that's changing. Here, here in Australia, everywhere around the world, community expectations are changing in many, many ways. Their attitudes towards democracy are changing. People's idea of what a democracy is now are quite, quite different. People's understanding of what government is, what government is supposed to be doing. 
people's understanding about the handling of public information by government, by big data corporations, they, they are evolving very rapidly. But I think, unique to our age, they're evolving not in a, a consistent, homogenous way. They're evolving in unpredictable and various ways. Uh, communities' uh, expectations are actually becoming more fragmented. Uh, people are becoming more individualistic. People have a very personal relationship with their past, with us as archivists. We're dealing with issues of, of human rights, of course, but we're finding in order to protect someone's human rights, it, it's not as simple as keeping their records safe. Uh, some people regard their records as their identity. I think all of us regard the, the records, the memory of who they are as representing their identity. We have a very personal relationship with our identity. Some people would rather we destroy the records about their past because that does not reflect who they are. Some people would like us to alter the records of their past because they have themselves changed over their identity, over life. They don't want their birth certificate to read like that anymore because that's not the person they are today. Um, as I say, sometimes we need to keep things secret. Sometimes we need to keep things public. And in between, there are all sorts of different ways. We have to release records to communities that's sensitive to the cultural requirements of that community. Um, so th these are all sort of attitudes and things that we're thinking about today uh, during the course of this conference, which are far more sophisticated and nuanced, I think, in the traditional view that many people have about archives. You keep records, 20 years later, you make them public. Well, no, that's not it anymore. It's very, very different now. Um, and I think one thing, though, that I'm, I'm very uh, emphatic about is one thing that's consistent here is that we do need to keep records because as, if, as society evolves, as, uh, as I was very interested reading Laura Miller's book, and I know Laura is here with us, um, but many people would be familiar with Laura's work where she's really in analysing well, what is truth. And, and I think what I take away from these discussions is that truth is whatever you think it is today. But what matters is the evidence upon which that truth can be made. So our archives have to keep the evidence so that the next generation can arrive at their own version of the truth. And what separates us from other uh, memory institutions is that we're not therefore keeping records because we want to remember some, some good things and we're not keeping records because we're ashamed of some bad things. We're actually just keeping records because we want to remember. We want to faithfully be able to reobserve the past and make fresh observations because society is changing so quickly we don't know what we're going to discover. We can look at a record again uh, and we'll discover something completely new. And I do think one thing I've learned in my time uh, working within archives is quite counterintuitive is that the past, I think the past is just as unpredictable as the future. You know, this idea that hindsight is 2020 vision doesn't work anymore. Every time we look backwards, we discover something quite new. So the past is unpredictable, maybe even more unpredictable than the future. And so that's why this conference and this theme, I think, is so very important. And that's why I'm encouraging all of us here gathered now to really challenge ourselves to rethink what we're doing, put people at the centre of what we do. We should be prepared to rethink, to challenge ourselves to... to upend the traditional values that we operate on to make sure that what we are doing is making the collective memory of humanity at the very best possible service to the people that make up all of the societies that we serve. And so with that I'll conclude. I will uh, simply say that we, we also need this opportunity of these conferences uh, to enjoy and update ourselves. We have a wonderful uh, set of uh, uh, exhibitors stands at this conference. I do encourage all of you to visit those stands, have conversations with those uh, people. I acknowledge uh, uh, our major sponsor, Ancestry, and I encourage you also to meet and have conversations about what they might be able to do to help us in our mission. And I do thank our sponsors for their continuing support for these events. It simply isn't possible to do it without them. Um, so with that, I'll conclude by saying welcome to you all. Um, Michael, I'm from Canberra, which is the land of the Ngunnawal people. In the Ngunnawal language, it's Gurubari for welcome, Murugawudi for thank you. So I say thank you to you, and I say Gurubari, welcome to all of the, the people here. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, wish you all the very best for this conference. Thank you.
question over there, so I've got one. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> Right down, there we go. Hello, welcome. My name's Julia Mant. I'm the uh, president of the Australian Society of Archivists and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, I sudden realised as I sat there looking at the lovely spring day, dangers of wearing glasses that are automatically change colour. If I look like I'm wearing my sunglasses, I'm not. I'm just trying to see. So apologies if they change colour and I look like that. Uh, Thank you, Mr O'Brien, for a very generous welcome. I too would like to acknowledge the Ghana people on whose land we stand, and also the generosity of spirit that um, exemplifies so many of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as they, we really have learnt so much and uh, how critical the archives are for our First Nations. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, here in the room and also to Elders past, present and emerging I'd like to extend that welcome to First Nations visitors from across the world who are here today. There are many from, from uh, all over the world, really. So I welcome you here, and I hope it'll be a wonderful week. We actually have uh, people from 76 different countries here. We've got 138 speakers and 58 sessions. So it's an absolute smorgasbord of uh, intellectual debate and challenging engagement and conversation to be had. Uh, we're here in Adelaide. Now, I'm from Sydney, actually. I'm not from Adelaide. But I lived here in Adelaide in the 1970s. And those years, for me, were quite halcyon days. I often look back on them with a lot of nostalgia as I roamed wild on my bike uh, through the, the wide streets. And those years in Adelaide, um, well, we would go to the theatre, we would go to the festival centre. I would beg to go to the gelato bar in Hindley Street, the seedier end as it is now, I think. But the point about that time in Adelaide was that it was a real cultural change. And it was uh, led, that change was led by, uh, I guess the word would be flamboyant, uh, Premier of the day, Don Dunstan. And he really had a vision for developing a cultural economy here. And rather than a main road through the centre of Adelaide, he actually encouraged what is now, what we were able to enjoy last night, that hub of government buildings that are in the centre, that are all together, and uh, developed the festival centre, which so dominates the Adelaide culture here, um, and is very much part of Australian culture as well. And he also, uh, I guess, the, the food and wine that is so emblematic of Adelaide was all really emerged in those 1970s. So, in actual fact, um, Adelaide is a perfect place to hold a conference. The reason we're here, though, is that we were going to be in Adelaide, and uh, we hold ASA conferences every year um, across different states. We even hold them in New Zealand at times with our Kiwi cousins, as we call them, very successful ones. And so this year was going to be the ASA Arans conference when I got that now infamous phone call from David uh, to say, could the ICA come along? And I said, sure, that'd be fantastic because actually it's a wonderful thing for our members to be able to extend those conversations. For the ASA is actually made up not of predominantly government archives, but in actual fact, uh, members from across a wide range of sectors, including schools, uh, universities, churches, religious institutions, uh, private organisations, and so that annual exchange of ideas and connections is really quite critical. And if we can extend that with our international partners, obviously Australia hosted the ICA Congress in Brisbane in 2012, but it's such a unique event. Parbika then said, could we come along for the party? And of course, it was even one more wonderful to have our Pacific cousins. So I welcome, welcome our, our delegates from those nations too. We do have people from all over the world, so it's wonderful. So here we are in Adelaide. But the thing, now Tony mentioned it being a long time between drinks and Adelaide, and this is true. We won't go into the reasons. But I do want to note that Adelaide 2003 conference was not just about... Uh, here for the ASA conference, not just GLAM, but it actually 
the G, Adelaide put the G in the, into glam. It was the first real use of it and, uh, it, and I think because we were last night in the gallery and you could see how much a part of that was, that uh, historic memory of uh, South Australia, it made sense. And so now, of course, glam is universal and used all over the place, but in actual fact, its uh, inception was here in Adelaide. So we say a little bit of glamour never goes astray and people have really grabbed onto it as a concept. Um, so I do want to acknowledge uh, the Iran's president, Eric Buma, who was not able to be with us today, but Tina Jordan, the Iran's uh, Tehewinga Mahara secretary, is here as well, so welcome, Tina. And uh, uh, Opeta Elefeo from Pabika was not able to come at last moment, but uh, Amela Silipa is here, so welcome to them both, of course, joining David and myself as host. Um, now, the other thing I want to note about ASA conferences is that they're very much a, a time for perhaps really engagement, robust conversations, thought-provoking ideas. There is a conference code of conduct. It is, you can read it through the app. And I do want to just maybe encourage you to have a read through that and take some time to reflect. Um, now, on to our sponsors. So we have two major partner, one major partner and one major sponsor, and I do want to acknowledge the National Archives of Australia for their major partnership. It uh, is not possible to hold these events without that investment, and uh, the NAA has been a, uh, a solid supporter of ASA conferences over many years, and there is a good number of uh, uh, NAA delegates here, but I am assured that the office is still functioning across Australia, so it's, it's not everybody, is it? But it's, it's pretty much all the key people, yeah? Yeah, well. So thank you to the National Archives and to David. The other major sponsor is Ancestry, and we've been very fortunate at the ASA to have uh, the support of Ancestry for many years as our principal sponsor. Um, and I'm very pleased that they were able to join here today and, and take on the major sponsorship role. Now, I'm going to introduce, I'll just get my words up here. We've got uh, some few words from uh, Ancestry, and I'd like to, my great pleasure to introduce Quinton Atkinson, who has worked the last 22 years in the content department at Ancestry. He's currently the Senior Director of Global Content Acquisition and Partner Development. Quinton has spent a number of years working in the international uh, arena for Ancestry, where he's travelled to many countries, and you indeed may know, well him, know, well him, know him well, including the United Kingdom, Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, Australia, Mexico, Spain, South Africa, and China, and he's worked there with local and national archives. He works out of the Ancestry headquarters in the United States, and it's my great pleasure to welcome him today to give the sponsor's address. If you could please make him welcome, Quinton. Thank you very much. Um, I have one primary objective this morning in the few minutes that I have, and that objective is to not detract from um, the wonderful welcome and spirit that we've already be begun to feel. Um, I'm from South Africa originally, and uh, what I've learned in the, in the few days I've been here and uh, really in the few years that I've been associated with, with Australia it's not lost on me that greater recognition needs to be given for um, the original people uh, that exist on land. There have been movement all over the world, and as I travel the world, I think there's a lot that can be learned from what is happening in Australia. I'm sure it's been happening for a while, but I think other countries in the world can, um, can take a lesson from the acknowledgement that has been given to uh, those who, whose land we, we occupy now. Um, so that's my primary object objective, is not to detract from that. As I've attended a couple of receptions over the last few evenings, I've had a few people come up in the nicest possible way, come up and say, what are you doing here? Um, why is Ancestry here, and why do you attend this event? And as I've tried to stumble through answering that question, uh, I was reflecting last night on the uh, art gallery of South Australia that we attended. It was great for me to go down into the basement and to look at all of the artwork, um, but the place that I got captivated was in the little video room. I got stuck there for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And the reason I got stuck there was because it was there that I uh, learned about the artists. These little few minute vignettes of uh, uh, the artists talking about what they're doing and how they came about 
the artwork that they produced. And the common theme that I saw was two things. One is they wanted to learn themselves, and two, they wanted uh, others to remember. So to learn and remember, uh, and each of them seemed to be creating artwork for the purpose of learning and remembering their culture. And as I think about Ancestry's uh, purpose in associating with you in the archive space, I, maybe, maybe you can think of Ancestry as, as a bit of an art gallery. Uh, we aren't the ones that created the art. Uh, it's not our story to tell. Um, it's, uh, there are stories that can be told from the records that you have, from the documents that you keep. And part of what we feel uh, and what we try to do is to share that information so that others, as broadly as possible, can learn and can remember. Um, so that's why we're here. We're here to support the industry that helps people learn and remember their past. Um, I had two videos I was going to share, and I've been debating up until this last minute which to share, and after David's words, I, I know which one I want to share. Uh, but before I do that, uh, just quickly, this is who Ancestry is as a company. We are a family history company, the largest in the world in online family history with over three, three and a half million people using our services. And uh, we're also a DNA company where we are helping people through DNA discover more about where they come from and who they are. So that's who we are as a company, and over the last um, year, these are some of the countries and the national institutions that we have signed contracts with in order to help digitize and index records so that, again, we can broaden the learning and the sharing of culture. Uh, but not only do we work with archives for the purpose of adding content to our platform, we also uh, have projects where we want to reach out to the community and provide uh, more philanthropic work. So I just wanted to share with you one example of that philanthropic work, where over the past year we've spent almost a million dollars to help digitize the largest Holocaust collection in the world. This is an archive that was previously known as ITS, the International Tracing Service, set up, set up after World War II by all of the Allied forces in an attempt to gather records so that people could trace their uh, ancestors or their, their family who they uh, lost track of. Uh, for many decades, five, six decades, these records were kept under lock and key. And uh, through a partnership, we were able to help them bring uh, those records online. And so with the last few minutes I have, I just wanted to share a quick video with you that illustrates the importance of the records that you have, the remembrance they can bring, and um, the importance that they hold for people today. For many, many people who disappeared, who were killed by the Nazis, there is nothing. There is no grave, there is absolutely no inscription whatsoever, except for a line a birth date sometimes, and a name. These documents, it's a testimony, it's a witness to what happened. The Arizona Archives hold 30 million documents. It's the largest worldwide archive on the persecution by the Nazis and on the survivors after the war. We had the intention to publish large collections online and we didn't have the resources. So we were very privileged to find an excellent partner with Ancestry. The partnership essentially involves the archives digitizing the millions of paper documents that they have and Ancestry creating searchable indexes and people everywhere can search the records for free. Seven and a half years ago, I found a list from Auschwitz with my mother's signature on it. It was a list of 227 names that came from the Arrelson archive in Germany. What you can see at the front is Auschwitz, November 29th, 1944. It's a list of women prisoners. This is my mother's name. This is the number that was on her arm. This is her signature. And what's most compelling to me are the signatures, each different, each representing their personality. 
What I've been doing since then is going through name by name, trying to determine what happened to these girls, what's their story, where they come from, did they survive? I felt compelled to go to Arrelson to see if I could learn anything more, both about girls on the list as well as family members. This was a girl, 15 years old. As I was growing up, my mother told me if I would have an extra piece of bread, I would give it to Margitka. And if you had a gift of bread, that means you get to live another day. It is more important than ever to show uh, what can happen if these values about solidarity, about equality, about respect are not upheld. Living memory is dying for those that were involved in the Holocaust. We need to capture that information so that even when they are gone, experiences that they went through can be preserved and shared for future generations. Oh, wait, wait, what? What, what yeah. is this? That's my grandfather as well. It's extraordinary to see his actual signature and that he touched this card. It is a privilege for us to contribute because of people like Alan, uh, who are researching their relatives, but also other uh, victims of the Nazis, because we contribute to the fact that they will not be forgotten. Let's see. Uh, this would be a picture of my mother in Germany. I have the ability to do this sort of research, I have the time. Many people don't. For those who can't go where the sources are stored, the ability to look at it online is extraordinary. And it's a, uh, a wonderful thing that Ancestry is making it available for free to anyone who wants to see. The reason I'm doing this is not so much to pass this to my children, but to their great, 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 great grandchildren. Because one day when they wake up and say, who am I, what am I going through here? And when they look back and they see what happened with their great, great, great grandmother and her resilience, I want them to take that lesson. So I, I recognize that not everyone's archives hold content as heavy as maybe what the Holocaust is, but you know as well as I do that the records that you hold um, are important to those that are doing the research, those whose ancestors and whose names and whose information is held in those records. So that's why we're here. We're here to support you. Um, we're here to have fun with you and uh, appreciate being part of your organization, your community. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Quentin and Ancestry, for that presentation. Uh, and what we thought it might be good uh, to do, given the theme of this conference is a very strong theme around First Nations and First Nations archives, uh, identity dealing with the past and reconciliation. Um, following the presentations that we've had this morning, the address from His Excellency, the opening words from, from myself, from Julia, and now from our, our sponsor, Ancestry, uh, we thought it might be good, uh, Elder Michael O'Brien, you've very graciously given us your welcome and you've very graciously given us your time to spend some time with us and learn a little bit about what we're doing and, uh, and the journey that uh, archivists are on, in particular in terms of reconciliation with First Nations peoples. Uh, and so on that note, in, re in, um, in recognition of that, I wonder if I could invite you to the stage again and I want to present you with the Universal Declaration on Archives, which is a statement endorsed by UNESCO, which commits all of us to the use of archives for memory of the past, uh, rediscovery of identity, and really linking people together. So could you join me in welcoming uh, again Michael O'Brien to the stage and as I present the Universal Declaration of Archives to you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. We've got a photo over there. Thank you, thank you, David, for that uh, <clears throat> wonderful gesture and, uh, and for everybody. Uh, David, don't go anywhere um, because um, I, I have something for you. Um, uh, our people, uh, uh, in some ways, 
have always seen, uh, as I said earlier, the land being the oldest thing and all the knowledge and wisdom is held in the land. And, and so therefore, um, we've told, uh, I suppose, uh, our stories and we've collected all of our information, whether it be in the words we say, uh, the dances or the songs, or even the art that we produce. And, um, and today I, I want to um, exchange with you uh, that spirit of uh, giving and receiving. So I, I'm asking you to take a gum leaf uh, from this uh, branches here. Uh, yep, just a leaf, not the branch. <laughs> now you're taking more than knowledge. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, and so I'm going to uh, do the same. And uh, I give you this leaf and I'll take your leaf. Uh, because um, in doing this, uh, I, I want to say those words that I sort of said at the beginning, which was Nada Nadlu uh, Kamaka Yarakumanindi, which means uh, today we can give and we can receive, uh, but together we become one. What is uh, really uh, uh, important to understand is the leaf uh, is connected to the land by the tree. The tree is, uh, uh, has that knowledge and wisdom of this land and and so, therefore, you, the knowledge and wisdom has not only come through the leaf, but when we talk about ancestry and what part of the one of the things that they said was, your DNA, my DNA has been put upon that leaf, therefore, uh, we've shared our knowledge because no one person holds all that knowledge. And so it's a great reminder of, of sharing knowledge, uh, the symbol and the connections that we make uh, by understanding uh, not just only our culture, but all cultures, and, uh, and those connections that we can uh, continue to make. So I thank you for this uh, uh, particular wonderful gift and, and recognising uh, the wonderful work that uh, archives people uh, do uh, around the world. And uh, again, I say nakata and nechaya. Thank you. Um, a, a little housekeeping before we move on to our keynote address, first keynote address. Now, some people may like to have the keynote translated into French, as uh, Professor uh, Caswell is speaking. Could you please put up your hand, and we have people at the back who will bring you the headphones for translation. So hands up straight if you want the translation into French or want to practice your French. Ah, there's one. Oh, they have here, gentlemen here. And at the back, thank you. All right. Now, hello. Come and come and join us. So after the wonderful welcome, we will now move on to our first keynote and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michelle Caswell. She's Associate Professor of Archival Studies in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, UCLA, Los Angeles, where she also holds a joint appointment with Asian American Studies. Her work in critical archival studies engages how individuals and communities activate archives to forge identities, create robust representations, and produce feelings of belonging. Um, Michelle directs a team of students at UCLA's Community Archives Lab, which explores the ways that independent identity-based memory organisations document, shape and provide access to the histories of minoritised communities, with a particular emphasis on understanding their effective political and artistic impact. In 2008, together with Sampik Malik, Michelle co-founded the South Asian American Digital Archive, SADA, an online repository that documents and provides access to the stories of South Asian Americans. She is the author of the book, Archiving the Unspeakable, Silence, Memory, and the Photographic Record in Cambodia, 
which was published in 2014, and it was winner of the Waldo Gifford Leyland Award for Best Monograph from the Society of American Archivists, as well as more than three dozen, oh, she's also written more than three dozen peer-reviewed articles. In 2014, she edited a special double issue of Archival Science on Archives and Human Rights. In 2017, she co-guest edited a special issue on the Journal of Critical Library and Information Studies on Critical Archival Studies, and in 2019, she co-guest edited a special issue on decolonization. Her work has defined uh, co and refined core concepts in archival theory, including archival imaginaries, community archives, imagined records, radical empathy, survivor-centered archives, and most recently, feminist standpoint appraisal. So I think we're in for a real treat today, and it's my great pleasure, and if you join me in welcoming Professor Caswell to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for that welcome. Thank you all for being here. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I've been making Australian archivist friends for about a decade, and it's really just great to see a lot of you in this room today. Um, today's talk is called Appraisal as a Political Strategy, Centering Our Values on the Oppressed. And before I get to the meat of it, I have a bunch of caveats, so bear with me here. So first, my analysis is based on my experiences as an American, specifically a white American woman, and that's a very specific cultural context. So, but while my specific experiences may be different from yours or foreign to you, the overarching argument still holds, I, I will contend. And I think we can have a really interesting conversation after my talk about what specifically is different and what specifically is similar in your context, right? But in any society, there are always power imbalances and inequities. Um, and so that's really what I'm focused on here, even though I'm naming specific power imbalances and inequities from the US. I'm also going to be talking explicitly about feminism, and I'm not doing this to alienate the men in the room. I'm not a gender essentialist. Feminism is not just for women. Feminism is for everyone. So patriarchy hurts us all, just not equally. And a brief definitional note, when I talk about white supremacy, I don't only mean KKK members and self-professed neo-Nazis with burning crosses. That is definitely white supremacy but I mean something more pervasive and insidious than that, using Francis Lee Ensley's definition that white supremacy is, quote, a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily enacted, reenacted, across a broad array of institutions and social settings, end quote. Finally, if you find yourself feeling alienated or defensive by my use of terms like feminism, patriarchy, white supremacy, whiteness, I ask that you reflect on why that is, but please do that internally in your own spaces and not here publicly during the Q&A. Um, okay, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's begin. So I'll begin by telling you a story about myself, the telling rooted in the feminist epistemology of valuing the knowledge gained through lived experience. The year is 1993. I'm a freshman at Columbia University in New York. This is a picture of Butler Library at Columbia University. Um, for a few days every year, the university allows women to erect a temporary banner with women's names, um, not superseding, but on top of. Um, higher than uh, the male names that you will recognize etched in stone. So as a freshman at Columbia, it was very um, much an exceptional thing for me to be, given that neither of my parents graduated from high school, and I'm having a hard time adjusting to my new exceptional status. I'm used to not fitting in. I was one of the few white girls in my predominantly black public high school on the south side of Chicago. But this is different. My difference here is non-dominant and invisible masked by the whiteness I share with the vast majority of my classmates and professors. No one has to know I'm different, even as I feel the difference acutely. I'm enrolled in the required contemporary civilizations course. Since 1919, all Columbia undergraduate students are required to take this course, which has set prescribed texts, consisting of the standard dominant Western canon. You begin the semester with Plato, you end it with Rousseau. There are no white women on the syllabus and no people of color and certainly no working class white girls who went to predominantly black high schools. 
Needless to say, I'm having a hard time seeing myself in the readings. Glance through my copy of Plato's Republic or Hobbes' Leviathan from that time, and you'll find lots of marginalia of me writing racist and sexist. With each one of these assertions, I slide further off the text into an abyss of this is not for me and I don't belong here. There is no hook to catch me. My professor, by all accounts a brilliant teacher, keeps writing on my critical reflection papers, what from this week's reading can we take with us? It's a question still in search of an answer. Most of my classmates have gone to private boarding schools. They've read these texts before, some in their original Greek and Latin, and they've come here to perform a certain kind of curiosity for four years before inheriting the earth. In the readings, they are looking to justify this inheritance, and they find it. I know lots of other stuff that my classmates don't know. I know how to babysit a dozen kids at a time, for which I got paid a dollar an hour per child. I know how to stock shelves and bag groceries, for which I got paid minimum wage. I know how to make dinner for my family the nights my mom gets off work at eight. And I know all the lyrics to all the Cypress Hill songs. Cypress Hill is an American hip hop group from the 90s. By 17, I've read nearly everything written by Toni Morrison, by Howard Zinn, and by Alice Walker. But none of that seems important in that classroom. Eight weeks into the semester, Machiavelli week, I stage an epistemic coup. Instead of turning in my weekly reflection paper, I write a paper about how I don't belong there. This is not my world. I don't even want this to be my world, I decry. It's the last gasp of a class traitor, revealing also in the ways that my whiteness cultivated the very possibility of belonging in the first place. The next week, the professor bought me a cup of coffee after class and told me that I should look into, quote, post-colonial studies. It's the first time I've heard the term. I rush to the library, I look it up, I start reading. I'm grateful to finally have a hook. I stop sliding. I say this not just to introduce myself to you, hi, um, but as a long way of saying who you are largely determines what you know. My classmates could not have known what I knew and I could not have known what they knew. We came from different epistemological standpoints. We read the same texts in that class, but we read them differently. The problem is not the difference. The problem is that power legitimates some forms of knowledge over others. My classmates would not be forced to read the autobiography of Malcolm X the same way I was forced to read Leviathan. Reading Leviathan was my price for participation, for which I was supposed to be grateful. My classmates had no price to pay. They were already golden. So golden that their inheritance, intellectual and capital, was unmarked codified and enforced. The core just floated there in the ether, un unlocated in the racial capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy it existed to justify. It's alleged neutrality a convenient tool for those looking to mask their own complicity. There were no fingerprints on the core. This experience was repeated 15 years later when, as an MLIS student, I was introduced to the dominant Western canon of archival theory. This canon, written almost exclusively by white men working for government archives, did not speak to me. It spoke past me and against me. It did not situate itself. Its creators aimed to leave no fingerprints. It was just out there in the ether, masquerading as just what we know, needed to know to be archivists. So how is it that the dominant Western canon of appraisal literature in the 20th century ignores or devalues the standpoint of the archivist? How is it that even in the past 20 years, when archival theorists have acknowledged the subjectivity of the archivist, their positionality is largely seen as something to document and mitigate rather than embrace? How is it that those most familiar with the practical intricacies of how knowledge is produced and canons are formed, who make the decisions about what gets thrown away and what gets preserved in perpetuity, have denied the mark left by their own fingerprints? It is because the canon of appraisal theory largely has been created by those at the top of the social hierarchy who position their decisions as unmarked in service of power. They purport to be from nowhere, purport to serve no one but their employers, and purport to leave no fingerprints. We've lost much in the canonization of their ideas, foremost the value of the view from outside dominant power structures. So this talk aims to recuperate that which we have lost 
by applying feminist standpoint epistemology to appraisal theory. More specifically, I argue that feminist standpoint epistemologies help us rethink both the process by which archival value is determined and the archivist's role in that process, leading towards a new methodology, epistemology, and political strategy for appraisal, which I call feminist standpoint appraisal. Feminist standpoint appraisal inverts dominant appraisal hierarchies that value records created by those in power to justify and consolidate their power at the expense of records created by the oppressed to document and resist their oppression and imagine liberation. As such, feminist standpoint appraisal explicitly and unapologetically gives epistemological weight, thereby assigning value to records potentially activated in service to those individuals and communities oppressed by capitalism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy. Furthermore, feminist standpoint appraisal shifts our thinking about the position of the archivist from a purportedly objective, quote, view from nowhere, which in fact belies a dominant but unnamed white male position towards a socially located, culturally situated agent who centers ways of being and knowing from the margins. In valuing the unique insights gleaned by people on the margins, feminist standpoint appraisal refuses the notion that archivists from oppressed communities must overcome their positionalities to meet institutional goals and professional demands for neutrality, but rather values and leverages the insights gained from outsider status, viewing the attendant insights as an asset rather than a detriment to the archival endeavor. Furthermore, feminist standpoint appraisal calls on archivists who inhabit dominant identities to acknowledge their oppressor standpoints and actively work to dismantle them. So throughout, I take inspiration from Hope Olson's naming and subversion of dominant identities as universals in library and information studies. Olson writes, quote, the white ethnically European bourgeois Christian heterosexual able-bodied male web cham presence is labeled the mainstream, and hence the universal from which all, all, all else is deviation. The web cham mainstream is not viewed as a special interest, while the diverse others are. In a sense, universality slash diversity is the ideal of patriarchal reason." End quote. I will use Olson's concise and necessarily specific web cham label to reveal the ways in which WebCham perspectives have masqueraded as unnamed universals in methodologies for determining archival value. By exposing the unnamed universals in archival appraisal, I aim to undermine their truth claims and provide a different basis on which to claim knowledge. So first, what is feminist standpoint epistemology? I'll define feminist standpoint epistemologies as ways of knowing that acknowledge, in the words of Patricia Hill Collins, that's impossible to separate the structure and thematic content of thought from the historical and material conditions shaped by the lives of its producers, end quote, and that center the perspectives and needs of oppressed communities in the pursuit of knowledge. As such, feminist standpoint epistemologies accomplish two goals. First, they situate the previously unnamed web cham position as such revealing how the alleged universality of view from nowhere positions is a charade. And secondly, they give epistemological priority to positions emerging from and aligned with oppressed communities. Feminist standpoint epistemology observes that knowledge produced and cultivated by oppressed people gets dismissed, devalued, and in some cases labeled false by dominant power structures. More specifically, in contemporary societies, Knowledge is created by people of color, white women, indigenous people, working class people, disabled people, and queer and trans people have been derided such that they are either not recognized as valuable forms of knowledge or dismissed as patently false. These subjugated knowledges, in the words of Sandra Harding, are often seen as roadblocks members of non-dominant communities must overcome or vestiges we must lose to conform to and succeed in the academy and in the archives. Feminist standpoint epistemology seeks to recuperate these non-dominant forms of knowledge by not only stressing their intellectual legitimacy, but affirming that holding such marginalized epistemologies is in fact intellectually advantageous. That is, members of marginalized communities see things differently, 
than those who occupy dominant positions. And those differences in perspective strengthen and enrich the creation of knowledge, leading to better questions, better ways of doing research, and better scholarship. In this case, better means in better service of those communities who have been oppressed in the first place. In a reversal of dominant hierarchies, feminist standpoint epistemology claims that those who occupy privileged positions are less likely to produce work that interrogates the status quo. Sandra Harding writes, quote, knowledge claims are always socially situated. And the failure by dominant groups critically and systematically to interrogate their advantaged social situation and the effect of such advantages on their beliefs leaves their social situation a scientifically and epistemologically disadvantaged one for generating knowledge, end quote. Nancy Harstock, seeking to unmask and name the privileged positions masquerading as neutral, asserts, quote, in systems of domination, the vision available to the rulers will always be both partial and perverse, end quote. The ultimate aim of standpoint epistemologies, in Harding's view, is, quote, to produce knowledge that can be for marginalized people, rather than for the use only of dominant groups in their projects of administering and managing the lives of marginalized people. Furthermore, and of particular interest to archivists, feminist standpoint epistemology unmasks neutrality for the masculinist and white supremacist positions it obfuscates. Harding writes, quote, the more value neutral a conceptual framework appears, the more likely it is to advance the hege hegemonous interests of dominant groups, and the less likely it is to be able to detect important actualities of social relations. For Donna Haraway, such claims to neutrality render dominant epistemological paradigms unlocatable and irresponsible, meaning unable to be called into account. For those who inhabit oppressed positionalities, feminist standpoint epistemologies empower us to view those perspectives that have been constructed as barriers to success in the archives as indeed great blessings. For those of us who inhabit oppressor positionalities, feminist standpoint epistemologies can give us the tools to name and dismantle the oppression that has shepherded us in the first place. Our dominant notions of archival appraisal map consistently onto the dominant Western white supremacist narrative I got in my undergraduate core curriculum. The intellectual history of appraisal insists that archivists take allegedly universalist view from nowhere positions. These positions remain remarkably consistent in the past century of appraisal thinking, despite seismic conceptual shifts in our field. So here, in situating universalist claims in dominant power structures, I'm building on the foundational work of Anthony Dunbar and Mario H. Ramirez in the US context in applying critical race theory to archival studies. I also take seriously Burgess Jewell's observation that in the name of neutrality, we're erasing people, communities, and their humanity from the historic record. I take that as a given, and I ask, how did we get here? Our tour of the archivist view from nowhere begins with Hillary Jenkinson, a name familiar to many of you, um, in the UK Public Records Office, who famously rejects appraisal as an archivist's duty, and along with it, the personal commitments, priorities, and ideals of the archivist. Jenkinson writes, anyone who is to take upon himself the responsibility of destroying irrevocably archives which have come down to us from the past should do so on something more than a consideration of his own interests and of those of the time in which he lives. The archivist's career is one of service, his aim to provide without prejudice or afterthought for all who wish to know the means of knowledge. The good archivist is perhaps the most selfless devotee of truth the modern world produces, end quote. Jenkinson conceals that his alleged view from nowhere is actually the view from a large government bureaucracy, attending to an increasingly vocal working class and women's movement at home, and active resistance to imperialism in colonies across the world. To be in service to the work of others in this context is to be complicit in colonialism and its attendant racial capitalism and patriarchy. Thus, reading Jenkinson from a feminist standpoint epistemology that is starting from the perspectives of the colonized abroad and the oppressed in the metropole, we see that Jenkinson's moral defense of truth 
evades responsibility for archival complicity in deeply troubling systems of domination. By contrast, T.R. Schellenberg from the National Archives of the US advocated that archivists take an active role in appraisal, proposing the now foundational concepts of informational and evidential value and tests of uniqueness, form, and importance. His methodology assumes the archivist is positioned solely in service of its employer, namely that of a government agency. Appraisal decisions, Schellenberg writes, quote, should not be based on intuition or arbitrary suppositions of value. They should be based instead on thorough analyses of the documentation bearing on the matter to which the record pertains. In this framework, that which posits the archivist as a unique person with an identity occupying a space in a community and society as seen as a bias to be overcome with sound research skills. Here we see the shift from archivists being in service to the truth with a capital T to archivists being in service to the government or their employers. Starting in the 1970s, archival theorists in the Western tradition shifted the intellectual authority for appraisal from the institution to the society. Terry Cook's macro appraisal approach, for example, focuses on appraising bureaucratic functions rather than the records themselves. In this approach, archivists conduct research and make appraisal decisions based on the functions fulfilled by records creators. Like its predecessors, macro appraisal assumes that, quote, societal values should be the basis of archival appraisal. For Cook, the surest evidence of these societal values is their interaction between government agencies and citizens. By investigating the function of those government agencies, archivists can determine which functions best reflect the value of citizens and are thereby worthy of retention. Acknowledging appraisal, quote, is inevitably a subjective process, Cook advocates that archivists, quote, keep full and transparent documentation of their contextual research appraisal process, keep destroyed decisions, and resulting transfers of records, and should create and implement benchmark standards against which the appraisal process itself can be judged." End quote. In this way, sound research and methodology can temper personal agenda. Yet Cook's approach assumes a fully functioning democratic government that fully reflects the values of its citizenry an assumption increasingly out of step in the US context, I'll add. This assumption reflects a position of dominance. In contrast, feminist standpoint epistemologies legitimate the views from outside the system. Outsiders know to mistrust the intentions of the government and its ability to accurately represent the will of the people. From the perspective afforded by feminist standpoint epistemology, invocations of society are a totalizing, universalizing, colonizing tendency. Society is never only one thing, and when it's constructed in the singular, it always already leaves out minoritized communities. In this way, macro appraisal replicates the view from nowhere thinking. The late 1990s bore witness to the latest bursts of appraisal theory, as archivists struggled to make sense of dominant positivist formulations in the wake of postmodernism and deconstructionism. Many of these postmodernist and deconstructionist contributions to appraisal theory do acknowledge the active role the archivist takes in creating value via appraisal decisions. However, in most of this literature, the archivist's personal perspective is still seen as an obstacle to overcome rather than a standpoint to be leveraged. Karen Trace accurately summarizes postmodernist and deconstructionist views of appraisal by stating, quote, any grand narrative and any unifying theory of a appraisal are impossible because worth and value are subjective notions. Adding, in this situation, the best that archivists can do is to be transparent and open about the ideas and the processes that shape their appraisal decisions. Again, a political position or identity is seen as something that must be acknowledged and overcome rather than an epistemologically valid viewpoint to be leveraged. Yet just when we might give up on appraisal theory in a fit of despair or slide off without a hook, we reach the work of Vern Harris, who I know spoke at ASA two years ago. Harris embraces the positionality of the appraising archivist in creating value out of inherently distorted slivers. He demonstrates, quote, no observer, no writer is exterior to the object of his or her observation. Hallelujah. 
Um, his work offers a powerful critique of the field's historic claims to objectivity. He writes, and I quote at length here, archivists assume that they can remain exterior to the processes that they are seeking to document. That, of course, is not possible. They participate in those processes. They are complicit in the recording of process. The appraiser's values, quality of work, perspectives, interaction with the creators and owners of records, engagement with the policy he or she is implementing, and so on, all become markings in the appraisal and determine what becomes the archival record. The appraiser is co-creator of the archival records. For appraisers, the ultimate objective is to preserve records with archival value. But what constitutes archival value is and will always be specific to place, time, culture, and individual subjectivity. It does not dangle somewhere outside of humanity, immutable, pristine, transcendent. So here we final, finally see a hook on which we can hang standpoint epistemologies. Yet Harris also tempers the idea of giving individual creativity full reign in the appraisal process, stating that archivists must also be held accountable to policies and programs, an accountability that can be evidenced by, quote, the appraiser demonstrating critical self-awareness, disclosing assumptions, and maybe even attaching a biographical sketch in the case files. A feminist standpoint epistemology would ask in return, accountable to whom? and explicitly value accountability to those most marginalized rather than employers, institutions, or a vague notion of society. More recently, archival theorists, myself included, have shifted the focus of appraisal from reflecting society's values to those of the community. The invocation of community in the US and the UK usually signifies a community of color, but often such significations remain coded, implicit, and ill-defined. Writing in 2007, Shilton and Srinivasan propose a community-based participatory form of appraisal. Although participatory appraisal can potentially revolutionize archives by shifting power to oppress communities, it too can elide the position of the archivist. In the attempt to get as close as possible to the community, we have obscured the positionality of the archivist in relation to that community. And I know my um, early work is guilty of that. As this brief tour of the past century of the dominant canon of appraisal theory demonstrates, archival thinking has suffered from an allegedly universalist view from nowhere thinking that has in fact masked webcham identities, positionalities, and agendas. Over the past century, archivists have shifted the grounds on which they've claimed archival value, from the truth, to the government, to society, to the community. Yet alighting the standpoint of the archivist remains remarkably consistent. It's in this intellectual genealogy that feminist standpoint appraisal intervenes. Feminist standpoint appraisal provides the grounds on which to determine the value of records. Here, as in all archival appraisal epistemologies, the general epistemological question of how do we know what we know is refined in the context of appraisal so that we may ask how do we know the value of records. Feminist standpoint appraisal then asks what does the view from those who are most vulnerable suggest about what to collect and from whom? It then answers this question by stating that the highest value of records lies in their ability to serve the needs of oppressed people. Rather than promulgate a universalist notion of bringing balance to the historic record or diversifying it as an afterthought, feminist standpoint appraisal begins with the view from the margins in the determination of value. It acknowledges all knowledge is partial and attempts to, attempts to diminish the perversity of that partiality by serving those most in need. Feminist standpoint appraisal posits that mainstream archives employing dominant appraisal methodologies have resulted in archival collections that over-represent dominant groups. In this way, feminist standpoint appraisal presents a corrective to this over-representation of webcham identities and priorities in archives. Feminist standpoint appraisal explicitly names a shift in allegiances from dominant institutions and structures to people and communities most oppressed by those dominant institutions and structures. It calls for an inversion of hierarchy in which we can, in the words of Jarrett Drake, who I know also spoke at ASA two years ago, learn the most from the least. To be clear, records created by people in power can serve the needs of oppressed communities and in fact are crucial for legal, cultural, and political efforts for justice and reparation. 
However, what makes a feminist standpoint appraisal different from dominant forms of appraisal that also value the records of people in power is the explicit aim and orientation of feminist standpoint appraisal to serve the needs of the oppressed rather than those from dominant groups, or is in most appraisal epistemologies to no one in particular. Indeed, in most appraisal literature, you're not supposed to consider use or users at all. I'm not arguing that we altogether stop collecting records created by people in power. I'm arguing that we do so with the needs of the oppressed in mind. Thus, for example, while a functional analysis or macro appraisal approach and feminist standpoint appraisal might yield the same results, that is, identify the same records as being worthy of value, the aim is explicitly different. Furthermore, feminist standpoint appraisal explicitly values the vantage points of archivists from oppressed positions. Taking a cue from Patricia Hill Collins' writings about black women researchers in the academy, feminist standpoint appraisal asks that managers, institutions, policies, and structures do not ask archivists from oppressed communities to submerge their own personal and cultural biographies, but rather to trust them, quote, as significant sources of knowledge that are named and exalted in the appraisal process. It also acknowledges the way that archivists from oppressed communities have been silenced punished and erased when they've tried to leverage this knowledge in professional settings and seeks to repair and correct those structural inequities. Here, the danger of being oneself fully in a professional context are not equitably distributed, as women of color theorists have noted. In the archives world, Chaitra Pal, Holly Smith, Shanae Moraine, and Skyla Hearn have described how predominantly white institutions appropriate the expertise and positionality of black women archivists when it benefits the institution, often to the detriment of black women themselves. They write, quote, we feel affirmed in showing up as our authentic selves with our diverse identities and seeing that as an asset to our profession, not a liability. Rather than shift the responsibility on archivists from oppressed communities to change their labor practices, feminist standpoint appraisal shifts the responsibility to employers, institutions, and structures to welcome and reward their critical perspectives. This approach thus enables archivists from oppressed communities to leverage the knowledge gained by their positionalities to value records created by and potentially activated in service to those made most vulnerable. For archivists from dominant groups, feminist standpoint appraisal offers an opportunity to align archival practice with oppressed communities by both acknowledging and dismantling oppressor standpoints and attempting to center oppressed standpoints. Such an alignment takes time and work. It will be a journey, not a destination. Archivists will not get a certificate from a professional association acknowledging their adoption of an oppressed standpoint that they can frame and hang in their offices. For those of us who do inhabit vectors of privilege, feminist standpoint appraisal should be less about claiming an oppressed standpoint and more about owning up to our oppressor standpoints. It will entail namely and dismantling the oppression that creates our privilege in the first place. Feminist standpoint appraisal acknowledges that part of the reason why archival collections are such distorted over-representations of webcam identities has been what Jarrett Drake rightfully calls the unbearable whiteness of the field. This is echoed by Burgess Jewell's claim in reference to digital archives. Quote, who gets represented is closely tied to who writes the software, who builds the tools, who produces the technical standards, and who provides the funding or other resources for that work. It's also echoed in Tanya Sutherland's pointed question, what does it mean for someone who holds blackness as otherness to make decisions about creating, maintaining, using, and sharing records about black Americans? It has meant archival collections and appraisal strategies that further alienate rather than liberate. Feminist standpoint appraisal demands nuance, and here's where I try to ward off your critiques in advance. Um, of course, inhabiting a marginalized identity does not necessarily make one's work liberatory. People who are oppressed in some contexts certainly may be oppressors in other contexts. Identity is never easy or stable. We must be cautious about valorizing or romanticizing oppression. We must also be careful not to collapse important differences, cultural, historical, social, and political, into a generic umbrella of oppressed. Furthermore, people who inhabit dominant identities may align themselves with, 
learn from, and act in support of people who are oppressed, but they should not appropriate their knowledges. Feminist standpoint appraisal eschews essentialism, even as it remains wary of easy claims to allyship. We cannot let feminist standpoint epistemology be used as an excuse to further promulgate the whiteness of the profession by claiming that white people who seek to adopt marginalized positions are just as good as, or can adopt the perspective of, archivists of color. Rather than bolster the credentials of white people, feminist standpoint appraisal should instead help to dismantle the white supremacist theories and structures that keep people of color and other minoritized groups from becoming archivists in the first place and remaining in the profession once here. Furthermore, the proposed approach to appraisal does not seek to reify simplistic or essentialist binaries, but rather calls attention to power dynamics in a necessarily nuanced and context-dependent fashion. We can talk more about how to put this into practice, how to enact feminist standpoint appraisal in your own jobs as archivists. I have ideas, but ultimately it's up to you, the practitioners. And I wanna be clear here that there are already several archival projects, both organized by independent community archives and community-minded university archives, already employing what I would call a feminist standpoint approach to appraisal, as evidenced by the ways in which they center the perspectives and experiences of archivists, activists, and artists from oppressed communities. Forgive me that these examples are all American because that's the context I know best. Examples include documenting the now, Project Stand, People's Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland, the Texas After Violence Project, and the South Asian American Digital Archive. Not surprisingly, archivists of color started and sustained these projects, seeing gaps in the historic record that their white colleagues either did not see or did not work to fill. The proposed feminist standpoint appraisal is a plea for the profession to value the vantage point that warranted these projects, reward the labor involved in them, and inspire more like them. And to be clear, by reward and value, I mean financially, materially, and professionally. Feminist standpoint appraisal is also explicitly a political strategy in that its ultimate aim is the use of records and archives for the liberation of oppressed people. Accurate representation in archives and the emotion it engenders, what I've termed elsewhere as representational belonging in the face of symbolic annihilation, is a key step along the way to liberation, but it's not an end goal in and of itself. Feminist standpoint appraisal does not start and stop with more representative archives, but explicitly asks about the liberatory uses of such collections. Liberatory uses of records may take the forms of historical evidence to establish fact, legal evidence in claims for justice, land reclamation, or material reparation, or cultural evidence to imagine futures unbound by the oppressions of the present. In summary, I've proposed a new appraisal theory, methodology, and political strategy by bringing into conversation two disparate strands, archival theories of value and feminist standpoint epistemologies. In so doing, I hope to revive vigorous debate on archival appraisal that has remained dormant for too long. The stakes are too high to let my students and colleagues from oppressed communities inherit a tradition that does not acknowledge their own epistemic value one that in fact asks them to sublimate who they are to do the work of an archivist. I do not want these students and colleagues to have an I don't belong here and this is not for me response, similar to the one I had sliding off Columbia's core curriculum so long ago. I want them to get hooked. Feminist standpoint epistemology has the potential to transform archival appraisal and help liberate a profession whose theories and practices have done far too much damage to oppressed communities. We're faced with a choice, archivists. Are we going to continue to reproduce the unmarked, partial, and perverse worldviews of those in power in our classrooms, our writings, and in our archives? Or will we have the courage to name how capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy have permeated our field, then locate and shift our relationship to them? Will we have the conviction to align archives to center the most oppressed communities? Can we build a new canon of archival theory, one that both acknowledges and dismantles oppressor standpoints and centers the standpoints of the oppressed? Who gets hooked and who slides off? It's up to us. Thank you.
you very much, Michelle. Um, I think that these uh, it's so critical to have these viewpoints come to us and to think and reflect on at an individual level. Sometimes we go, well, what can I do? And sometimes it's about just engaging with the systems that we have, the people that we employ. It's not all, you know, we don't always have to make major changes in what we do in every, in every day, but it's definitely worth to think about, so thank you. Now, we've got time for some questions. So hands up, we've got two roving mics that are around. And Jenny at the front, your hands up nice and straight, thank you. Hi, thank you. Is that working? Yes. That's working. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, as a white transgender lesbian archivist, um, that spoke to me hugely. Um, I'm glad. Um, I suppose my, my, my question, my, my request for comment is, and from my experience of working with community, um, let me think. It's. Given that most of the major archival institutions are born of colonial and repressive regimes, um, my experience is that many marginalised communities don't trust them, don't trust white archivists, yeah. and so are left to conserve and preserve their own records with the inherent um, lack of resources that are afforded to mainstream organisations. Yeah. Yeah. So how would you propose or how would you discuss the, the, the idea of, of mainstream archival organisations collecting, appraising, providing access to the records of oppressed groups when we have the fear that by giving our records to those institutions, they may be served in future to oppress us further. Right. Such a good question. Thank you so much for it. It really sort of um, gets at the heart of the issue, right? Because I think, at least in the American context, there's this huge pressure now on archivists to diversify their collections. And what they've done is then gone out and um, replicate colonial extractive mentalities, where then they go into those communities that they have not valued, that their universities or government agencies that they work for have in fact been oppressing and extracting from those communities for you know, the past century, um, and then extract those materials and bring them back to the university repository where they're essentially not accessible to members of those community at communities and then subject to all kinds of intervention like you know, processing and description um, that further imposes this um, uh, dominant structure onto those materials. Um, I've done a lot of work with community-based archives in the US, and the primary thing that unites community-based archives is a lack of funding, right? They are struggling financially because they are so chronically under-resourced and underfunded by mainstream funding institutions, whether those are private foundations or government grants. It's starting to change a little bit. Um, but many of them are volunteer operated, many of them have leaky roofs, many of them can't have digitized anything, they have no infrastructure to do that. Um, I think one possible solution is a post-custodial approach, right, where um, university-based archivists work in conjunction with those community archives, um, not ripping custody away of, from those materials from those communities, but working more collaboratively to provide broader access if that's what the community wants. I think the most important thing that archivists working for dominant institutions can do to community archives is respect their autonomy. So that's the first thing, respect their autonomy. Um, realize that 100 years or 200 years of extraction is not going to change overnight, right? And that, um, that archivists are seen as um, uh, representatives from the university that has been extracting from those communities for so long. So it's going to take time and uh, it's gonna be rough, right? Nothing about working with community is ever easy, right? It's gonna be rough. Um, and I think in some ways it feels like the work is impossible because the structures of power are so strong and have been around for so long. Um, and I tell my students, it's impossible, but do it anyway, right? Because the resisting is in and of itself liberatory. That feeling of saying, I'm not gonna do this anymore, right? 
the buck stops here, that is a liberatory feeling in and of itself, um, but still keep fighting even if it's impossible. But yeah, it's, it's, it takes, it's gonna take a lot of time and energy and a lot of listening and relationship building. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I hope, thank you very much, Michelle, it's amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm Annalee, I'm from the university of, well, Monash University today, actually. Um, I just wanted to uh, reflect on the fact that as a white archivist, um, I have the privilege of choosing on which days to, uh, to put my thinking hat away and kind of just go with a policy or something like that. Um, whereas members from an oppressed community don't have that option. Uh, they every day feel the responsibility from their community to make decisions um, that supports that community. And that's something that we need to be better as a profession at recognising and just re recognising that risk of burnout yep. among um, archivists from oppressed community groups. And just the fact that we have that incredible privilege every day to go to work yeah. and not go home exhausted uh, because we don't feel necessarily that, that responsibility. So thank you very much for, yeah. for your talk, it's great. Yeah. No, that is a really important point, the level of burnout and exhaustion and emotional weight that um, archivists from oppressed communities experience on a daily basis and that those of us who are white, who are from oppressor communities, um, we can forget about it at the end of the day, or we might have one day where we feel, um, you know, particularly stressed out because of racial tension, and then we turn on the TV or walk down the street, and uh, white supremacy um, is still the structure that is shepherding us, right? Um, and I think uh, we need, it's one of the many reasons why we need more archivists of color, right, so that there's not such a major burden on um, the few archivists of color that are in our field. Um, but we also need, I think, a full frontal assault on white supremacy in terms of um, our foundational concepts and practices. Um, it's not just a matter of who um, is a part of our MLIS programs or who becomes archivists, all that, that is important. Um, but if um, people of color come to MLIS programs and are learning only white supremacist values and concepts, that's not gonna go very far, right? And so I think we need to do some really critical, deep, structural work on all levels. I think that given the time, and uh, we are back here at 11 after morning tea, Michelle is here all week, and uh, I'm sure that uh, over morning tea you could continue the conversation. So we, we might leave it there. I don't see any other hands burning to answer a question right now. So if you could join me again in thanking Michelle Caswell for her fascinating and challenging talk.